Baruch haba, Rabbi Eli Fisher. Thank you. I welcome you to the yeshiva, but it's probably more appropriate to welcome you to your home. Um, literally and spiritually and intellectually, how much you drew and continue to draw, as well as to deliver to so many people across the world with your writings, your translations of Pinini Halacha, making that available, and just um, contributing to Jewish thought and Torah thought. So thank you for coming and visiting us during Elo. Thank you. And I feel like I'm bringing coal to Newcastle coming to the Gush. It's, uh, um, yes, this was at three great, wonderful years here in the Kolel. And uh, um, you know, I, it's great to be back. Okay. Well, you didn't just come back on a sunny April afternoon. You came back in the heart of Chuva, the fish of the Chassam Sofer. I can hear the fish of the Chassam Sofer screaming Elo. So the fish are here screaming Elo. I don't know if the walls are screaming Elo. Um, so all of our thoughts as we get near to Slichos, as we get near to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, Tshuva. Um, let, let, let's tackle it from this angle. Tshuva undergoes many different evolutions. It's highly contextual, it's emotional, it's cultural. It, uh, it tethers itself to the cultural milieu and undergoes many different revolutions. So in some periods in history, it's very dark. Some periods of history is very light. Sometimes it's cast as pessimistic. Sometimes it's cast as optimistic. Sometimes it involves people who see tshuva as a mandate and, and, and a demand to deprive themselves of physical experiences, to, to punish themselves for their sins, to go to a very dark place. It's not so popular in our culture. But what has happened to tshuva? What's the state of tshuva in the year 2022? as opposed to the year 1622. Yeah, so I think that to use a text that we're all familiar with, or many people are familiar with, before Yom Kippur, there's this tefillah that was composed really only 200 years ago called Tila Zaka. And in Tila Zaka, it has several themes. And one of the themes is that we say that by denying ourselves these pleasures on, you know, the five, the five forbidden pleasures on Yom, on Yom Kippur, that should atone, that should compensate for all of the forbidden pleasures that I got. Meaning, so if it's, you know, if I accidentally or on purpose ate machalot asurot, I, I ate something non-kosher, I ate something that I shouldn't have eaten. So by, betri- by depriving myself of food for this day, that should atone. And that was almost the, paradig- the paradigmatic, um, the paradigmatic paradigm, well, paradigmatic, the paradigmatic template of tshuva in specifically in Ashkenaz from the medieval until early modern until early modern times this this idea that tshuva is supposed to uh, that tshuva is something to balance the divine ledger right i have debits and i have credits so i want to accrue credits that are going to specifically counterbalance and wipe out uh, wipe out my debits. Well, there are different ways to wipe out debits. One way is to go through one day, deprive yourself of food and enjoyment, but it was a lot more comprehensive and a lot more searing than just not eating for a day. I mean, people would give themselves malchus, people would deprive, people would abnegate. Yeah. So I'm thinking, so I, I think, look, I, I don't think the the history of it, as fascinating as it is, um, I don't know how much it's going to help us in our avoda for Elul. So, if you don't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it a little bit and ask the question like, okay, we have these sources, and they're, they're fascinating sources. Is there any way to, is there any, is there any aspect of them that we can incorporate into our own tshuva today? And I think, I do think that on some level the answer is yes. And this is something that I started thinking about it a lot last year. You have both, let's take responsa, right? Chuvos, shelos or chuvos, but really has nothing to do with, uh, with the chuva that we were talking about. Uh, responsa, answers that rabbis wrote to, you know, when various questions were posed. And in the early modern period, you find a lot of responsa that are written Somebody made a really grave mistake, error, sin, um, 
usually in the Ben Adam Lechavero realm. Um, something that was really, and, and if it was Ben Adam Lemakom, it was something public. It was something that jarred the community. And the penitences, and there's really no better word for it than penitences, they're prescribed, right? And these include things like um, public confession of the sin, meaning getting up before Kriyata Torah on a Monday or on a Thursday, sometimes in multiple different towns, right? You have to travel from town to town. Gullus. What? Gullus. Yeah. Travel from town to town, confessing your sin publicly in each town. Um, you have to change your seat in the shoal, move to the back of the shoal, or move to near the door so that everybody can, everybody sees you right there at the back next to the door when they come in. Um, fasting Mondays and Thursdays and sometimes more, sometimes fasting for 40 days straight. Really excruciating, mm -hmm. right? And malkot, right? As you mentioned, flagellation, um, but publicly. And so I guess where, where I think about that today is that if we, I've noticed that we, we don't know how to, we don't know how to apologize anymore. Right? We don't know how to make amends anymore because and for two reasons. One is because you know the people that actually committed an offense, you know, their lawyers are saying don't admit anything and don't really say. So you get all of these mealy mouth sorts of apologies, like I'm sorry if right. you were offended. As, like you take my agency out of it, not I'm sorry that I offended you, but. If you were offended, so that's on one side. And on the other side, you have things where, you know, I'm going to use the cliche cancel culture, where for one sort of mistake or one person once did something and it goes viral and that completely shuts down any kind, there's no way back. Right. And I think that's something that these public penitences can do, these public expressions of remorse that are really excruciating, um, it, it provides a way back to rejoin the community. Right. And I think that that's something you can argue that that even goes back to the Torah. The Torah's punishments are, I mean, the non-capital punishments are to provide a way back. Right. We, we undergo these processes so that there's, there's a path to rejoin the community, whether it's a you know, Amitsora or Tumantara, or whether it's, you know, once somebody is you know, once somebody has their 39 malkos, you have to treat them as a tzaddik. There is a way back. You don't, you, you let them, you let people go through this process. There, there's, there's a, there are recipes, there are prescriptions for these sorts of processes that we can come back from. And I think that's something that maybe that should be more on our consciousness. It's interesting that you say that because your focal point and, and I, I hear what you're saying, and, and there's an art to apologizing. <laughs> and an apology shouldn't be virtue signaling, an apology shouldn't have modifiers, an apology shouldn't be this, this lodging agency, as you said. Maybe we have to work. I mean, my wife once recommended, I forgot whom, but there was actually a podcast, four or five part series about how to apologize and what role apologies play in, re re in rebuilding ruptured relationships. But your focal point was the community and being. Um, excommunicate or being you know, dis dislodged from the community returning to the community it, it raises a whole different question what what role does community play in our world how much do people feel part of a community how do we define communities people will define virtual communities and being shamed or as you said canceled online but I don't know how much the actual especially in Israel where we're living a national experience and communities play less of a role but that same question should be ported into the private space how does a person what types of um, responses and recipes, as you said, can help a person process, feel the shame, recover, um, have a sense of catharsis, um, and not just in ways that paint tshuva as transformative and part of growth and part of a process, but that create pain, shame, guilt, but allow someone to <coughs> to deal with the guilt. And I, I was always um, impressed and intrigued by the tshuva of David Melech, because the tshuva we see in Tehillim, which is this raw outpouring of shame, religious energy, uncertainty, and security, the Lili Amanti lisp to Hashem, but then there's a quieter tshuva in Shmuel Beis, and that's resignation and acceptance of life struggles as 
perhaps his due comeuppance in his, in his due. And, and when Avshalom rebels, and when Avshalom, and, and when Amnon rapes Tamar or, or abuses Tamar, and, and as he's attacked by all of his foes, and as he's belittled by Shimi bin Gera, and there's resignation, there's tolerance, there's even acceptance. There's a matter that says, Ladavid Mizmar Bivachom Rebne Avshalom. This is the Paragimel. How could David be singing when he's running away from Avshalom? Should be mourning. He should be frightened. He should be angry, and we're all angry in life when life doesn't turn out the way we expected. The frustrations, the, the, the struggles in life, and when a person sins, it's almost if there's not an equalizer, but I don't deserve everything I expected. It's very dangerous because it could be very self-diminishing, and it can lower self-esteem, and it can victimize you, turn you to a victim. But that healthy equanimity that my life is also flawed and my past is also deficient and when things happen have more generosity of spirit to other people and understand the frailty of the human condition so I, I think there's a that same dark space in the modern sense not just creating communal re re-entry but creating personal well, maybe we'll talk about this in, in one of our other sessions i always mm -hmm. let's look at ruvain and someone just couldn't get over the guilt he just couldn't deal with all the guilt. I mean, when he says to his father, if I don't bring Binyamin back, my two sons should be killed, he's jealous of Yehuda because Yehuda lost two sons hmm. but got past it. Wow. And was able to move on. It's just so, it's so transparent. Why would you want your two sons to be killed? Because he just never got over the guilt wow. and ran him into the ground. So, but maybe let, let's take a step back. Why has our community, either at a communal level, personal level, why is that type of, I'll call it a dark tshuva, a, a, de a deprivation-based tshuva. What about our world? What does it say about our world? Why is that less popular? So I, I think part of it is just the material culture that we live in. And I don't think that there's an, I don't think it's an accident that, I mean, the real rebellion against this sort of dark, dark tshuva is, it begins with the rise of Hasidus in the 18th century, right? That one of the one of the things that the Baal Shem Tov taught was that we can, we, we don't have to, we don't serve God necessarily by de depriving ourselves of this world, but you know what we call kiddush hachomer, using the material world around us in our avodas Hashem. So even something like in that day, right? You have ideas that you know when when a uh, you know when the Rebbe smokes his pipe, the smoke that cloud that fills him is like the is like the the avoda no, no, of the yeah. kohen gadol and yom kippur, right? And you know, and obviously, eating becomes something that's holy, and drinking becomes something that's holy. Right? It's not the deprivation of these things. So that is something you know that's growing up in a world that's, on one hand, I, I think that you have. Look, I, I don't want to turn this into a, a history lecture, but I think you have, you know, a certain bourgeoisification of. Um, you know, in, is going on in Europe, including in the Jewish places in Europe, and um, material wealth is something that's much more, at least on a, you know, more than a subsistence level, is something that's available to a lot more people, and I think that that's naturally going to shift the way that people, um, the, the way that people express their, their avodas Hashem, the, the type of avodas Hashem, the patterns of avodas Hashem that resonate with them. Right, you know, today it's going to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. You know, this year maybe not, but in general, I won't count people out yet. Yeah, I'm sure there will be some people that get there. Right, they got there under. Uh, there was never forget what before Corona. They got there during the Soviet era. Right. Um, Baruch Hashem. Yeah. So there are people that are most in effort for that kind of thing. But I think that for for the Hamonam, for you know Balabatim in the New York area, it you know it wasn't really feasible, right? That once it becomes feasible, once it becomes an, a feasible part of my religious experience, people are going to, people are going to resonate. It's going to resonate with people. People are going to be attracted to it. And I think that that's part of the history here, right? There's no, you know, just because somebody writes something in a book doesn't mean that that's going to catch on. And just because the Baal Shem Tov said, you know, let's be, let's serve Hashem through the physical, it didn't mean that that was going to catch on. There was an audience there to receive it, and I think that the timing was crucial for that. Yep, yep. 
Look, there's no question what you're saying is correct. Also, you know, we didn't buy into Marx, we didn't buy into Spinoza, we didn't buy into Darwin, all of whom tried to find forces that drive the human condition beyond your control, but we did buy into Freud. And Jews have embraced the world of Freud, and Freud exempted us from guilt. Freud, uh, we had our, mother, had our fathers, we love our mothers, and everything else that was just being driven by uh, uncontrollable forces. So it's hard to feel guilt when you feel you yeah. know, live in a determinist world. That's how I learn and teach. There's a famous Agada in, in Avodah Zara about uh, Elazar ben Dordaya, um, that he was, you know, um, a rake, as they would uh, as they would call it. He was he was a he committed all kinds of sins, and at the end of the story, you know, he he feels a tremendous amount of guilt. And he says, you know, let the sun and the moon daven for me, let the stars daven for me. Meaning he's, it seems to me like he's looking for some other, it was my upbringing, it was because, you know, it was natural it, forces. This is how I was born. It's natural forces, it's psychology, it's context, it's upbringing, it's all these things. And then the end of the Gemara is, in Hadavar Taloi Elobi, meaning he is accepting agency for his own actions. Um, and I think that that's sort of like a working through of that, that Freudian, that Freudian approach. And, um, you know, maybe that's a good segue to talk about the next topic, which is who are our role models? Is uh, Rav Lazar ben Dordaya <laughs> a role model for tshuva? Is there, you know, the Gemara says that because of that one moment, he was called Rebbe. Right. Um, and which seems to imply that he has something to teach us. Maybe not all of us. Um, certainly, it's not recommending to go down his path yeah. in order to do the tshuva that he did. Uh, and I think it's also significant that he, at the end of the story, he dies. Right? He says, "In a davar taloy elabi, it's all up to me." And then he starts crying and sobbing. He dies, and so we never get to see whether or not. The transformation Occurs. withstood, yeah. right? Meaning it was an instantaneous transi tra um, transition, transformation. Uh, we don't know if it would have lasted a day, a week, a month, the rest of his life, because we don't get to see that end of the story. Okay, so maybe maybe we'll pick that up in, in our next session, who are role models for Chuva. But thank you for coming, and thank you for helping us explore the different varieties of tshuva, the different emotional landscapes of tshuva. Thank you, Robert Fisher. Thank you.